The following program is underwritten by the Nevada Irrigation District. Since 1921, providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties. host Lou Sitzer. This is NCTV Interviews and today we really have a quite a special program. This is our first hour-long interview and it's really the culmination of a few years of work uh, looking at the poets, authors, artists in our community. Today we have Gary Snyder, uh, not only uh, nationally known but internationally recognized Pulitzer Prize winner, author of 18 books in print and six or seven out of print. That's my of, guess. Yeah, and many of the books right here. Uh, I've uh, really followed uh, as much as I could Gary's work while I've been here since 1971. And Gary came here about 1970. 1970. Right. Just the year before you. Right. So. Uh, it's been great talking with Gary in preparation for the show. And so for those of you who aren't um, really aware of uh, Gary's work or life, we wanted to go into uh, some of the early childhood, not too early, but the idea that you grew up in the, in the Northwest, in Washington, in a farming family. Would you describe that for us? During the Depression years, um, my father, who had been born in, in the Pacific Northwest, and my mother, who had moved up there when she was 12 from Texas, uh, managed to settle on a few acres of land outside the city, Seattle, uh, to the north, uh, and in uh, what we, uh, up there, what we call stump land. Uh, started a little dairy farm, chickens, a small orchard, uh, vegetable garden, and that's what I grew up working on with a mile walk down to the local grade school near the town of uh, what is now known as Lake City. Uh, so that was a good Depression era, hard working, uh, simple life uh, that my sister and I uh, actually grew to love. Mm -hmm. and, and that uh, is something that has been a theme throughout your life, that you've maintained a sense of um, uh, connection with, uh, with the woods, the wild, the northwest, the mountains? I never stopped having curiosity and questions about it. Uh, that's, it's, I'm not sure why that should be the case, but uh, early on I started exploring the forest that was nearby, uh, camping and sleeping in it overnight sometimes, even when I was eight or nine years old. Uh, and then I fell in with people who took me fishing, uh, and later people who took me backpacking up in the high country, in the Olympics and the Cascades, and by the time I was 15, I'd started uh, Snow Peak Mountaineering uh, in the Northwest. What kind of mountaineering? Snow Peak. Snow Peak. You know, like Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, Mount Adams, Mount Jefferson. So you had this uh, um, desire to climb the peaks. 
Well, when I saw them, yes. <laughs> Once I saw them, I thought, that's a good place to go. <laughs> and um, so how did uh, this, um, this experience, childhood experience, lead you to, um, to sort of develop poetry uh, as a, um, a profession? Well, poetry as a profession is an accident, but uh, I grew up delighting in language, and I was able to, luckily, able to read from an early age, and so I read widely uh, while also working and exploring around. Uh, and poetry seemed to me to be one of the things that was perfectly natural. Uh, it's what people do with, one of the things people do with language, not exotic, not esoteric. Uh, I've always felt that, and I guess my mother, who was quite a literate person, uh, enforced that for me. Uh, so uh, it was one of the many choices, you know, that one of the many interests that I had that I was able to follow up on. Uh, and language is a wonderful, mysterious thing that we are all born with, and we use it all our lives without much considering it and how it works. And uh, I'm one of those people who really wanted to understand why ling how and why language gets the way it is. So maybe that's part of what might lead one to poetry. I first started writing poetry after I did uh, mountaineering, Snow Peak mountaineering. Uh, I couldn't find another language to describe what it was like to be up that high and how it felt uh, early in the morning, before dawn, cold, the tinkle of glacier ice falling behind you as you chop steps. It's a wonderful sensation. So I started writing poetry from mountaineering rather than from failed love affairs, which is where most poetry starts. <laughs> <laughs> I came to that later. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, you're, you're right when I think about the times that I've been up in the mountains. And it, it, is, a, it is a very quieting, mm -hmm. uh, thoughtful experience, which leads one to uh, want to write things down. Well, it gives you a, another perspective on space and on time, and uh, seeing all of those vast uh, forests up there also uh, gave me a sense of what North America really was like, what it had been like, uh, and also I could see the clear cuts coming in, uh, and the spread of the city, and somehow I ended up sort of taking the side of nature, uh, as I have done ever since, and. Uh, including uh, the condition, the situation of the natural world in my moral compass. Uh, wanting to be as much a spokesperson for the natural world as for the human world. And so from a, a childhood uh, in, in the Northwest, uh, you worked in the forestry, in the forest service? Oh, that came later. Came later? Yeah, I, I was working on the farm. Uh, uh, when I was younger, milking cows, shoveling the stuff. Uh, I got good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, gosh, when I was in my mid-teens, well, as soon as I was able to, 18, I went to work as a summertime forest service backcountry laborer, trail crew, uh, and sometimes firefighting. Gifford Pinchot National Forest, and then later uh, the Mount Baker National Forest. And then in between, I started going some seasons to uh, logging uh, on the east side of the mountains with the Warm Springs Lumber Company over in Eastern Oregon. So uh, I was out there both with the Forest Service and with the timber industry. And then you decided to leave for Japan. Well, oh gosh, you're making it. I have to tell you a complicated story. <laughs> well, I'm not sure we have all that much time. No, well, my interest in nature led me to an interest in the Far East, partly from having seen those wonderful East Asian landscape paintings mm -hmm. of mountains and streams. Uh, and after uh, going through uh, several years of study of uh, North American Indian linguistics, graduate school in Indiana, I came back to graduate school in Berkeley to study classical Chinese and Japanese with the intention of somehow getting to Japan uh, to find out more about East Asia. And 
that got me to Japan, sure enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you spent con a considerable amount of time there. I had a domicile in Kyoto, Japan for 12 years. Uh, I was out to India for six months one time. I was back on the West Coast for a year another time. But I, that was where my home was for 12 years. And you, um, from what I remember, you uh, became a monk? Uh, I became a, what you might call, we don't have these categories in the West, a kind of a lay monk in the Zen school of Buddhism. And I uh, lived in Buddhist temples for a couple of years. And I studied and worked in another Zen monastery for a number of years with a Zen teacher. And I got to be pretty good at Japanese. And that, that uh, experience has pretty much carried you throughout in terms of your interest and involvement with Buddhism since. Oh, well, I'm a Buddhist. What can I say? I've actually, I became a, a Buddhist in my own mind before I ever went to Asia. Mm -hmm. You know what made me into a Buddhist first? Discovering uh, that the Buddhist ethics include non-human beings as well as human beings. You know, thou shalt not kill only applies to human beings. Mm. Uh, the Buddhist uh, precept says, uh, don't hurt anything if you can help it. Doesn't matter how big or little. And I thought, that sounds better to me. Mm -hmm. It fit my sensibility. And so that is part of my, you know, evolving environmental conscience. Uh, but Buddhism has also uh, a, a powerful psychological and spiritual training uh, and uh, elegant philosophy uh, that is intellectually very demanding. Uh, so I fell for all of that. <laughs> so, I'm, and I'm wanting to move into your poetry, but I want to get to some items before that, and that is um, you came back from Japan, yeah. you um, <coughs> transitioned to a completely different society. Uh, you moved to the ridge right. and decided to take up um, residence off the grid mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a Japanese way. Well, I got, you know, I learned a few good things in Japan, and not just from Buddhist temples, mm -hmm. uh, but from Japanese farmers and Japanese fishermen, ordinary people. I did learn. Uh, tricks and tools uh, that added on to my Forest Service background. I was grateful for that. Uh, but my thinking about moving uh, back to the land, as we used to call it, uh, in uh, 1970, was not fueled by some kind of romantic escapism. It had always been my assumption that eventually I would want to live more or less the way it was when I grew up. I was a country boy, mm -hmm. and so I felt perfectly at home. Uh, settling in uh, where we were, off the grid as it happened. Uh, and many of the carpentry tools and uh, uh, small-scale woodcutting and logging tools that I have came through my father and some go back to my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Well, the, and, and we're looking now at, at your home uh, and your dog uh, and seeing that living off the grid doesn't necessarily mean living without. And actually, it's, uh, it has the advantage of being in touch with so many different things. Here are solar collectors, which enable you to have computer and um, other amenities that um, you've found to be useful. 20 years after uh, uh, burning kerosene lamps and Aladdin lamps, and that was our light for 20 years, mm -hmm. then I decided to get solar panels. I'm very conservative. Very slow to move on these things. <laughs> but when I did, I decided it was a good thing. And so I'm very happy to have those now. And of course, that enables us to have uh, computers. And uh, we even have uh, a disk, a dish, you know, to download the internet. And it all runs on solar. Well, um, that really contrasts a lot with my own experience, which was living in a city mm. uh, throughout my uh, early life and then discovering this part of the back to the land movement, mm. which enabled me to leave Southern California and, and take up something, uh, somewhat uh, a similar life, not, not parallel, well, parallel, but not, not mm. exactly. Uh, 
And so um, having come up to this county and, um, uh, in 1971, I just found that, uh, that it, was, it was an important part to connect to nature. And it's a lot of experience that a lot of people in cities don't have. It's true. Um, there is more nature in the city than people think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have urban bioregionalist friends like Peter Berg who leads uh, fish walks, bird walks, and insect walks in downtown San Francisco. Uh, and That's to great. point out how much is actually there. That's great. Uh, also, uh, San Francisco is right on uh, the Pacific Coast Flyway, and it's right where the hawks come over when they're migrating. So you can count hawks going by from a lot of high points around the San, right in the city of San Francisco. There are people who know that. Mm -hmm. You know, I really am happy about the uh, development of an interest, curiosity, and knowledge about the natural world that's taking place society-wide now, whether you're in the city or in the country. You do not have to be out in the country to do this. Well, that's good to know, because it's a time where we do need to renew our uh, connections. It is. Yeah. And of course, if you're going to live in the country, uh, out in the rural areas, out in the uh, semi-forested, semi-wilderness, uh, you have to take on your local issues. And our local issues are, uh, in part, proper forest management, long-term forest health, uh, forest ecology and ecological systems in general, and the threat of wildfire and the, hist and the history of wildfire. Uh, so, you know, I consider those sort of backyard or front door issues that I must deal with because they're in my world as well as, you know, larger global issues. And we're going to be, you know, talking and hearing more of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was thinking about uh, the, f the first time I actually heard you read was, uh, was really, a, for me, an altering experience. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, I thought maybe you could read something uh, at this point. Um, I was thinking of Song of the Taste because, uh, as I told Gary earlier, we were so taken with this one poem that we created um, uh, season greetings cards with this poem that we sent to friends at that time in 1971. I'll read it if I can find it. You have what page it's Yeah, on? I do. Uh, it's, it's right here if you want to take from my oh, book. Oh, okay. This poem called Song of the Taste was written in Kyoto, Japan, uh, after I'd been there maybe three or four years living in Japan. And uh, on the side, beside, uh, as well as you know, language uh, and history books, I was reading some uh, English language books on ecology and biology, uh, scientific ecology, uh, and getting deeper into it so that at one point it occurred to me that one could say that the study of ecology uh, was the study of energy transformations, meaning things eating each other. Uh, and it led me to a reflection on well, what is it that we are eating? Uh, so then I wrote down this poem called Song of the Taste, which is still really one of my favorites. Song of the Taste. Eating the living germs of grasses, rice and wheat. Eating the ova of large birds. The fleshy sweetness packed around the sperm of swaying trees, apples. The muscles of the flanks and thighs of soft-voiced cows. The bounce in the lamb's leap. The swish in the ox's tail. Eating roots grown swole inside the soil. Drawing on life of living. Clustered points of light spun out of space, hidden in the grape. Eating each other's seed, eating Ah, each other. Kissing the lover in the mouth of bread, lip to lip. What I love about poetry, uh, and this illustrates it, is, is sort of going beyond the word and dealing with uh, combinations that would not be on our ordinary speech pattern, bringing up images that are that are innovative. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what poetry is hopefully is going to do. 
And as Basho, the great haiku poet, said, speaking of those little tiny poems, he said, the words stop, but the meaning keeps going on. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, a lot of your life has been in the forest, and um, uh, a lot of your study has been how people have dealt with forest and the history of forests. So in moving to your place, um, mm. in particular, what, uh, what did you need to do to become, um, to, to become safe? Safe? Well, maybe that's the wrong word. <laughs> what I meant was to be um, uh, s secure when fire is present. Oh, talking about fire. I didn't become safe for a long time. I'm not safe now. Uh, one of the things you do is recognize the danger and the impermanence of all things with a calm mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that helps. Uh, another is to be somewhat prepared. Uh, and so having done some forest fire fighting in the Northwest, I had my own duff hoe, which is called a McLeod in California. Uh, Pulaski's axes, saws, chainsaws later on. Uh, back, back, equipped ourselves with backpack pumps. Uh, for a while, we, a lot of us had two-way radios when there were no telephone lines out there. Radios in the trucks and uh, radios in the house or mobiles. Uh, we had uh, actually a community firefighting team uh, way out on the margins in areas where the great, you know, the wonderful North San Juan, San Juan Ridge Volunteer Fire Department can't always get there right away. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing you do, of course, is clear out the underbrush and limb, uh, limb up the trees, uh, get the fire ladder out, pile up your brush, and in those days we always burned the brush piles. So over 37, 38 years, uh, I've managed to push the brush and the fire ladders back quite a few hundred feet from the house itself. And yet, it looks good. It looks wild. I was just out this morning clearing. I've got piles of manzanita uh, that I've cut trying yeah. to keep things down because uh, as you know and we all know living in this area, fire uh, uh, creates, I mean, uh, a dangerous situation, particularly now so oh, that yeah. the forests have so Overgrown. Oh yeah. Well, so thanks, thanks to the great energy of the government in suppressing all fires, uh, which they are always going to do, suppress all fires uh, of whatever sort. You know. Uh, also, you know, we've been burning firewood for 37 years for a lot of cooking and almost all of the heating, and that eats back at the uh, the buildup on the forest floor. Uh, it's wonderful living this way. Uh, and I've never had any hesitation about uh, going about it, but I realize that people who have come here recently, newcomers, uh, who are taking delight in their little wild plot of land, are uh, very sensitive about cutting or trimming anything back. I can respect that. Uh, so it helps to know that that thickness and density of uh, vegetation uh, doesn't necessarily represent a, nat a natural state. It represents uh, uh, a state that has come about uh, from the absence of fire uh, over the last hundred years. Because as the Sierra Nevada is described, it is a uh, fire-adapted ecology uh, within which low-level fires should be going through every 25 or 30 years. And if the, that was the pattern before um, uh, white people came out here and started changing the direction of the woods. Uh, you have a poem that addresses that. Uh, is that the control burn? Control point? burn. Shall I read that, please? Oh, yeah. I know where that is. Okay. 219. <coughs> this was written the second or third year that I was living up here, too. 1971 or... 1972. Uh, mm. I think it might be. Here it is. Yeah, great. Uh, what we called a control burn, what everybody called a control burn back then, is now more accurately called a prescribed burn. And it means 
a forest fire of relatively small dimension started deliberately uh, for, the for the purpose of helping the forest return more to its natural and original state, uh, but keeping it uh, in a scale and under conditions that will keep it from getting out of control. Still, prescribed burns sometimes get out of control, and we shouldn't let that bother us too much unless it happens to be your house. Uh, what the Indians here used to do was to burn out the brush every year in the woods, up the gorges, keeping the oak and the pine stands tall and clear with grasses and Kit Kit dizzy under them, but never enough fuel there that a fire could crown. Now, Manzanita, a fine bush in its own right, crowds up under the new trees mixed up with logging slash, and a fire can wipe out all. Fire is an old story I would like, with a sense of helpful order, with respect for laws of nature, to help my land with a burn, a hot, clean burn. Manzanita seeds will only open after a fire passes over, or once passed through a bear, and then it would be more like when it belonged to the Indians before. So I have neighbors who are doing prescribed burns every year or so. Mm -hmm. With the cooperation of the BLM, the Forest Service, Volunteer Fire Department. Well, I know that the uh, Forestry Service is very concerned as we move into summer and uh, not having had a lot of rainfall, mm -hmm. trees being stressed, um, that there will be uh, great fire danger. And so moving toward um, uh, some uh, a safer, defensible space mm -hmm. is what it's referred to. Right. Is, is it should be a concern of all of us, uh, and somehow um, you know I think the the forests will um, will benefit as well as you say. I mean, as I'm cutting manzanita, I realize that this is a good thing. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be the whole forest. Right. <laughs> no. Although, if we were looking way ahead, uh, it would be ideal to eventually bring at least some of the Sierra Nevada forests back to that pre-contact state of uh, relative openness, quite a few large big fireproof trees, and, and then some smaller trees, all aged mixed together, but uh, with periodic low-level fires, uh, keeping undergrowth buildup from presenting a big hazard. Mm -hmm. you know, given enough time and and persistence, maybe that could be brought about. Or on the other hand, one of these days, we may just get a huge forest fire that goes up and down the Sierra Nevada. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've, we've had signs of that in the past, mm -hmm. the 49er fire probably being the most recent one. And, right. And, um, and really, it was remarkable how our community did rally together and, um, and work, mm -hmm. much as the yeah. ridge would work ha it, ha if there were a fire. Yeah, well, they learned a lot from that, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it was after the, the 49er fire that uh, every summer I take about uh, uh, 10 or a dozen uh, archive boxes of my most valuable and important uh, papers uh, with red stickers on them and stack them neatly in a cube near the door of the barn. That's what goes in the back of the truck if we have to evacuate. Mm -hmm. I always have it ready to go. Mm -hmm. Includes my passport. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to come back to some points that you make throughout your writings, and that is uh, when we first came here, uh, my wife and I, and started a family, um, there was this notion of being of the place, people mm -hmm. of the place, having essentially roots staying long enough, not being transient as we move around in this world, and sinking roots and, and becoming uh, more integrated. And I was just wondering, um, it seems that that has been an important theme as part of your writings. It has, yeah. And I I as part of my own self-education, too, uh, the idea of place, uh, the importance of place, 
uh, and how one goes about uh, realizing, so to speak, where you are. Uh, it is possible to have been physically resident somewhere for decades and still know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may be part of the problem with uh, American settlement in uh, much of this continent. People were moving in too fast to take time to learn about it. Uh, what I think of when I think of learning the, uh, about the place is uh, annual rainfall, which establishes uh, a lot for the vegetation. What is the vegetation zone? Uh, what differences are there with altitude? These are things that anybody growing flowers or vegetables would also want to learn. Uh, what is the lay of the land? Where are the major creeks and rivers? What are they doing? And what was, here's a really interesting question, what was the original vegetation here before uh, the contemporary world went to work on it? Original vegetation is kind of a baseline it's a database for what that landscape will do on its own account. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of, of original vegetation right here now that we can look at. There's also a lot of introduced trees around. If you keep your eyes out for them, you'll see them like the locust trees. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, much more introduced plant life down in the valley. Uh, and then understanding California first step is to know that it is what is called a summer dry winter wet climate and that it has a six month drought and then it has a six month rainy spell. Many places in the world, most places in the world, do not have a climate like that. That's called a Mediterranean climate. So it sets a certain type of tree and shrub going and it makes for specific adaptations on all levels. Uh, and that just helps you tune yourself into you know, what might be going on where you are. And then also, if you know original vegetation, you can appreciate what might have been drastically done to alter things and be in a position to judge if those changes are healthy or not so healthy. This is true, actually, for the whole world, and much more so for Europe. I was in Spain a few years ago and spent some time in the uh, the marvelous old city of Barcelona. One of the first things I learned about Barcelona was that it was um, started as a colony first by the Carthaginians. The Romans came quite a bit later. Uh, so I asked uh, some of those wonderful Barcelona anarchist intellectuals, you know, in Catalonia they still have anarchists mm. who frankly and gladly tell you they're anarchists. So I asked them, well, what do you think the original vegetation here was. And one of them said to me, oh, we don't think there ever was an original vegetation here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he even knew what the term meant. But it was the Carthaginians who first logged the area around Carthage. Mm -hmm. The Romans did a backup job after the first century BC. <laughs> so a lot of Europe has been so radically transformed that you, and China even more so, that it's like a detective search to figure out what was growing there 4,000 years ago. And yet it helps a lot to know that. So this is just one of the little territories that uh, I think are worth investigating. I think we can also learn a great deal from knowing how indigenous people lived in the landscape. What did they use for medicine? for food, for fiber, for soap, for dyes, uh, for making bags and baskets. All of that tells you some very important things about the place. And we also have uh, Native Plant Society. Uh, if, yeah, the if, California Native Plant Society. People are concerned and want yeah. to find out more. They can yeah. uh, attend uh, plant society meetings. Well, the Red Bud chapter is of the California Native Plant Society is based here in Nevada County, and they have field trips this spring every weekend, mm -hmm. virtually every weekend. They have a wonderful magazine called Fremontia. I must confess, I'm a native plant fanatic, <laughs> and I have subscribed to Fremontia from the first issue mm -hmm. about 25 years ago. 
Well, in that vein, I wanted to uh, tackle uh, sustainability. What is sustainability? Because it's something that um, we hear about and yet um, don't really know. Yeah, and, and it's become such a buzzword. Uh, and it's become, you know, like the word green. You can attach it to anything and make it seem better mm -hmm. <laughs> without necessarily having to be too critical about it. Uh, or, you know, people calling this or that kind of food natural. Right. When the truth is, in the physical universe, by definition, there's nothing that's not natural. That's another way of defining nature, scientific way of defining yeah. nature. I'm sure the food companies like that definition. Oh, yeah, it makes it really easy for them. <laughs> Uh, but sustainability, for me, uh, has to be ultimately based on the question of long-term available energy and uh, no net loss of biodiversity. And so explain biodiversity. Well, biodiversity means species, uh, as well as individuals. It means species and the habitats in which they live of animals, birds, insects, and plants. Uh, the planet, uh, over millions of years, uh, has evolved a, a marvelous array of beings that uh, are remarkably adapted and interacting incredibly uh, with each other, uh, which is indeed the sustainable f power of the natural world. Planet Earth and its ecology. Boy, what a story. And you know, this TV program that's running right now on the Discovery Channel mm -hmm. called Planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Outstanding, mm -hmm. remarkable photography. 11 series, 11 uh, programs all together. I think they've done about three already. Pick it up, get it, get the DVD. Okay. It, it, um, it is not preaching environmentalism. It doesn't have to. It just shows people, and most of us have never seen a lot of these things, what's going on on the planet. And that's really coming into play much more so as we hear about global warming, right. climate change, right. and, the, uh, and how it's all going to affect us. We're becoming much more aware of the connectivity of everything. Yeah, it's time, yeah. So sustainability in terms of forests, let us take that for an example would mean, in my uh, understanding, sustainable forest management uh, would be something that does not depend on outside energy inputs. That is to say, a fertilized and artificially irrigated forest plantation is not sustainable mm -hmm. because the energy sources might dry up. Uh, and uh, the criterion of biodiversity means your forest, from which you will be taking timber for fiber and lumber, will not lose any of its species, including spotted owls. And hopefully we can bring the fisher back, which is a, a, uh, a, a, a larger uh, predatory mammal of the weasel family, mm. which is now considered extinct in the Sierra Nevada, mm. or virtually extinct. Uh, and all of the other species that were there should be there. I think one of the fears that people have is the idea of biodiversity sounds great, but um, do we really have to give up what we've got in order to, um, to reach this kind of equilibrium? What have we got? <laughs> uh, not, with, not for forest sustainability, no. You might have to pay a slightly higher price for lumber. Mm. So what? Mm -hmm. You might have to pay a higher price for food, too, if we start having better food. Uh, we'll all pay higher prices for all of those things as the price of oil goes up. It's inevitable. Uh, so yeah, there are readjustments that everyone has to make there. And maybe you'd want to grow more grocery, more of your vegetables at home. Maybe you'll want to go back and burn a little more firewood for heat in the winter. And maybe we might want to walk or ride a bicycle more. Uh, and maybe we might want to have a, a better and more often used network of public transportation. It just makes me sick at heart every time I see these buses, county buses going out this way and out that way with only three or four people on them. You know, they're only doing that because the federal government is uh, 
underwriting it, hoping that people will begin to get back into using public transportation. There are a few people from way out on San Juan Ridge who catch the morning bus from clear out at North Columbia Schoolhouse, ride it all the way into town, do their shopping, catch the last bus going back out there at 5 or 6 p.m. That's the way to live in the third world. Mm -hmm. And you know, who cares? Pretty soon we're going to be in the third world, all of us. Well, before we get there, <laughs> we'll let's enjoy the rest of the program. Um, you, you received the... Well, I already checked out how much electricity it takes to run this. We can run it. Good. All right. <laughs> we'll just keep, uh, keep our lumber supply constant. Um, you received the Pulitzer Prize in uh, 1975, Turtle Island. Right. Was this uh, um, a surprise? It was, yeah. I, at that time, I was so involved living here and taking care of uh, the place and, and uh, lots of work still going on that I wasn't thinking about the East Coast at all and what goes on in the literary world there. But my book, uh, Turtle Island, which was published uh, by an East Coast publisher, New Directions, uh, it had a lot of environmental thinking uh, woven into the poems. And the word, the term Turtle Island uh, is a Native American word for the continent of North America. Uh, and it's still being used in a lot of places. Uh, and I liked it because it puts North America in another context. If you say the United States, you're talking about something that is a little over 200 years old. If you say America, <coughs> you're talking about something that is 500 years old. If you say Turtle Island, you're talking hundreds of millions of years. Mm -hmm. And that helps us get a sense of where we are. Uh, as it happens, the uh, committee for the Pulitzer Prize gave it the Pulitzer Prize. And uh, uh <laughs> a neighbor hiked into my place to tell me. <laughs> I didn't have a radio even then let alone a phone. And, uh, and since, have you found that, that that award, plus many others, ha has it changed your life, life appreciably? People ask this question, mm -hmm. and I have to be honest. I didn't think it would change my life, but it does. Uh, in American society, anything that gives you a little edge in credibility goes a long ways. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that now. I didn't understand that then. Uh, whether or not I deserved the Pulitzer Prize that year, or any year, nonetheless, if um, some organization or institution, some university is, you know, putting together their winter program of lecturers and speakers, and they've got a list of names, and then they say, well, this guy won the Pulitzer Prize. Well, let's get him. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's had that kind of benign effect. Uh, and it's made it just a little easier for me to make a living uh, over the years, I'm sure. Well, um, I'd like to, to move to a poem that uh, you wrote. And I think this, um, it was prior to the publishing of, uh, of Turtle Island. Uh, yeah. It's, it's uh, Smokey the Bear Sutra. Yeah, quite a bit prior. Well, five years prior. But it really it was written in the 60s, or maybe the late, uh, right around 1970? I started thinking toward it, um, probably in the mid-60s, when I was studying what is known as the circumpolar bear cult. <laughs> and the history of bear archaeology and bear finds in Europe, Germany, Spain, France, where they have um, caves that were occupied by bears 70,000, 80,000 years ago that they know of now. I was thinking about that. And then, of course, I knew about uh, the Forest Service and its Smokey the Bear story. Uh, and gradually, and then I knew some stories from Buddhist mythology about um, mountain deities and uh, uh, figures who uh, were unafraid of fire. And so it all sort of came together once I was back here in the United States, in San Francisco, in, in uh, February of 1969. And it, it, considering that it was written <coughs> almost 50 years ago, uh, it, looks, it looks at the world uh, as we see it now. Afraid so. Would you mind reading it? <laughs> okay. 
I don't know if this really should be called a poem or what. Uh, I titled it The Smoky, uh, the Bear Sutra. The Sutra is a, a Buddhist text. It's a Buddhist presentation uh, supposedly delivered to all kinds of beings, whoever is there, whoever will listen, um, on the nature of the truth. And there are many sutras. So I wrote this thinking of it as uh, a sutra, uh, a teaching text delivered to human beings by a bear. Uh, and I told myself, and I still tell people uh, just for fun, the Forest Service never realized what it was doing when it took this little cub that it found and made it into an icon. Uh, the icon belonged to a much greater and more archaic tradition than they ever imagined. And so its power is now beginning to be shown. Smokey the Bear. Well, no, that isn't where it begins. Here's where it begins. Smokey the Bear Sutra. Once in the Jurassic era, about 150 million years ago, the great sun, Buddha, in this corner of the infinite void, gave a discourse to all the assembled elements and the energies, to the standing beings, the walking beings, the flying beings, and the sitting beings, even grasses, to the number of 13 billion, each one born from a seed, assembled before him, a discourse concerning enlightenment on planet Earth. He said, in some far future time, there will be a continent called America. It will have centers of power like Pyramid Lake, Walden Pond, Mount Rainier, Big Sur, Everglades, and so forth. And powerful nerves and channels like the Columbia River, the Mississippi River, the Grand Canyon. The human race in that era will get into troubles all over its head and practically wreck everything in spite of its own strong, intelligent Buddha nature. He said, the twisting strata of the mountains and the pulsings of volcanoes are my love burning deep in the earth. My obstinate compassion is schist and basalt and granite to be mountains to bring down the rain. In that future American era, I shall enter a new form to save the world from loveless knowledge that seeks with blind hunger and mindless rage eating food that will not fill it. And he then showed himself in his true form of Smokey the Bear. A handsome, smoky-colored brown bear standing on his hind legs, which shows that he is aroused and watchful, bearing in his right paw the shovel that digs to the truth beneath appearances cuts the roots of useless attachments, and flings damp sand on the fires of greed and war. And his left paw in the mudra of comradely display, indicating that all creatures have the full right to live to their limits, and that deer, rabbits, chipmunks, snakes, dandelions, and lizards all grow in the realm of the Dharma. Wearing the blue work overalls, symbolic of slaves and laborers, the countless people oppressed by a civilization that claims to save but often destroys. Wearing the broad-brimmed hat of the West, symbolic of the forces that guard the wilderness, which is the natural state of things and the true path of people on Earth, and all true paths do lead through mountains. With a halo of smoke and flame behind him, forest fires of the Kali Yuga, end of the universe. Fires caused by the stupidity of those who think things can be gained and lost, where in truth all is contained vast and free in the blue sky and green earth of one great mind. Round-bellied to show his kind nature and that the great earth has food enough, for everyone who loves her and trusts her. Trampling underfoot wasteful freeways and needless suburbs. Smashing the worms of capitalism and totalitarianism. Indicating the task. His followers, 
becoming free of cars, canned food, universities, and shoes, master the three mysteries of their own body, speech, and mind, and then fearlessly chop down the rotten trees and prune out the sick limbs of this country, America, and then burn the leftover trash. Wrathful but calm, austere but comic, Smokey the Bear will illuminate those who would help him, but for those who would hinder or slander him, he will put them out. Thus, his great mantra. Nama samanda vajranam chanda maharoshana spataya hung traka hung mang. I dedicate myself to the universal diamond. May this raging fury be destroyed. And he will protect those who love woods and rivers, gods and animals, hobos and madmen, prisoners and sick people, musicians, playful women, hopeful children. And if anyone is threatened by advertising, air pollution, or the police, they should chant Smokey the Bear's war spell. Drown their butts, crush their butts, drown their butts, crush their butts. And Smokey the Bear will surely appear to put the enemy out with his Vajra shovel. Now, those who practice this sutra and then try to put it in practice will accumulate merit as countless as the sands of Arizona and Nevada. We'll help save planet Earth from total oil slick. We'll enter the age of harmony of man and nature will win the tender love and caresses of men, women, and beasts. We'll always have ripe blackberries to eat and a sunny spot under a pine tree to sit at. And in the end, we'll win highest perfect enlightenment. What a story. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, uh, it sounds a little biblical. In the sense that um, the well, it's it's a wonderful poem. It's one of, one of my absolute favorites. But in, in, uh, in, in the sense of the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, it just happens to be Buddhist. There must be some spiritual <laughs> truths out there, <laughs> shared east and west. I would hope so. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it uh, it brings me back. You know, it's like well, where is Smokey now when we need him? Um, but uh, a lot of it is, is our responsibility. Well, Smokey is out there standing around in the smoke of the big fires, like that, uh, that image that maybe came up on your screen, with his hands in the shows of gratitude, surrounded by flames, uh, appreciating the destruction and the suffering that a big fire might carry, but also knowing that it must happen sometimes. Uh, that's part of the nature of the universe. There it is. Yeah. Smokey the Bear Bodhisattva. A painting from a woman in uh, the Bay Area uh, who was touched by this sutra. Yeah. Uh, and some of the people that work on the fire lines in the Forest Service, the younger people, they get in touch with me. They say, we love that. So it's out there. Towards the end of your latest book, Back on the Fire, you, um, you, uh, you mention about uh, the world's problems today. You, know, uh, and you, you mention um, rising population and dwindling resources. Uh, and, and of course, we hear it and see it. Um, and you leave us with some um, possible, possible remedies. I don't know if you remember uh, that part. Uh, more women in politics. More women in <laughs> politics. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one people ask me about most. Right. Well, why did you say that? Mm. Uh, come on. I say, think about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, um, but wouldn't wouldn't hurt to elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, without any uh, uh, unnecessary and untrendy essentialism, uh, I do think that uh, women bring a different perspective. Uh, to economies and, and to politics uh, that they uh, uh, 
have a slightly different approach uh, to the possibilities of sustainability. I think they're less hysterical and less excitable uh, and uh, less reactive. Less reactive. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, they can be very tough. Uh, and that they're able to speak back to uh, some men who need to be spoken back to. Uh, and it is, in any case, a matter of some justice. Uh, I would also like to see other creatures given a vote, but that's a, a ways off yet. Mm. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it was uh, to sort of, as you were saying earlier, to. Uh, to preserve biodiversity as much as possible. And I think... Uh, I think we just yeah. take that as a moral imperative. We can't always be perfect with it, but it's just one of the things we agree to do uh, the best we can with. Yeah. Not sacrifice things. Not write them off as a sacrifice. And you're, you, you talk uh, about biodiversity in terms of what is non-human as well as what is human, but mm -hmm. you really want to bring in the natural world. Uh, uh, and you, but one of the things I see with biodiversity is that um, we need to preserve cultures and languages. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's another. That's that's not biodiversity. That's cultural. Mm. Uh, but we have endangered languages. We have endangered small ethnic groups with unique skills and knowledge and stories. We have endangered stories, uh, which are the folklore and songs of uh, these smaller groups. Arctic people, for example, Inuit, Inupiaq, Yupik, Eskimo people, they have told me, I've been to Alaska a number of times, that since they got lifetime satellite television up there, they've quit telling stories. Mm. That they're losing their story simply because they all go home and watch television in their little, their little not igloos, but nice little wooden houses. Uh, and they said before the television, even just, you know, a few years before the television, when evening came, we'd go over to one of the elders' houses, and the kids would love it, and there would be a storytelling time. That's being lost. They would also do homework, because they're all going to school, too. Uh, there are, uh, and languages, now that's one that is specific to my own background and interests. Uh, we lose a language, you know, there's languages dropping off like dead flies off the planet right now. Uh, Tillamook is uh, a language that has no speakers. Nishinin, the language that was spoken right here, no longer has any speakers. Uh, we've lost something every time we lose a language. And what, what do we lose? Uh, amazingly, every language has its own surprising strategies for representing, dealing with, organizing the world. And some of them you wouldn't even guess at. Uh, there are Native American languages that have not only time uh, uh, tenses for verbs, happened in the past, it'll happen in the future, they have space tenses. It happened nearby, it happened a middle distance away, it happened far away out of sight in the grammar. Mm. You know, there's so many things like that. So there's actually something we can learn from it. I think so, <laughs> yeah. And I always recommend Edward Sapir's small, precise book called Language which is but mostly about North American languages, uh, to give you a sense of how unexpected and different the strategies in the, in the world's different languages are. So as we, as we look at the world in t present day turmoil, mm -hmm. with uh, ethnic groups fighting one another and empires being um, um, expanded and contracted, uh, there is something to be gained by respecting differences. And there's a lot to be gained by respecting differences and learning about differences and understanding one another better. Undoubtedly that's true. Uh, there are dangers that come with, uh, in, in recent centuries, uh, the tendency of different small groups to get on each other's case and to have arguments and to have small wars. More recently, we've had the evolution of empires and larger nation states that have big wars. So we have to thread our way through this somehow. Uh, and even as, you know, a, a, an interesting kind of model is actually Europe and Asia, 
where you do have large nations and nation states, but go into them and you see there are villages and communities that each have their own sense of pride and identity and are, in a certain sense, keeping culture going and keeping knowledge of the given region going, like the different regions of Bavaria uh, or different parts of China, different agriculture, different dialects, different raincoats and different folk songs. Uh, I would not want to say all of this will disappear pretty soon as we have a kind of grand universal uh, new wor new civilization that will make all of those little varieties of things unnecessary. People were saying that 25, 30 years ago even. Right. Now we appreciate microbrew beer, you know, and artisan <laughs> cheese. So it's, it is going a little bit the other direction. Uh, <laughs> Well, I want to thank you. Uh, the hour has uh, passed very quickly, and I'm sure we could talk on and on. Uh, hey, I'm just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank the ROP crew once again for doing a great job today, and Gil Dominguez, the instructor. Um, hope you've enjoyed the program, and please, um, after this, turn off your television set, go outside, and um, have some fun, tell some stories. Thanks a lot. Check out the phase of the moon. You know that irrigation districts. Are we supposed to be quiet right now? Since 1921, providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer County.